Well, I'm gonna read this morning, if you would stand with me, from Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, beginning in verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under, or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Let's pray. Father, as we study this passage this morning, we ask as always that you will illumine us. Father, we, we come before you this morning humbly. We come confessing our, our sins. Lord, as hard as we try, uh, they continue to perplex us even as believers. And we pray that you will not just forgive us, but that you will give us, Lord, the impetus to do right. Help us to somehow let you live through us. That our life will be your life and your life will be our life. So we can say with Paul, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Would that, Lord, just please let it be true of us. We pray also, Lord, for those who are uh, absent from us. Think of Jesse who is flying back today. Give him safe travel and others who are on the road or in various places. We just ask that you'll bring them back safely when their travels are over. Lord, in the meantime, would you please use this time to be glorifying to you. Help our praise to be true and from the heart and to be something that would be a sweet aroma in you, to you. And Lord, as we've worshiped in song and we have worshiped through our uh, memory work in Colossians, now we want to worship through hearing your word. And then we want to worship by the way we live, Lord, as I understand the Bible, every single one of these things is an act of worship. So may we worship you in spirit and in truth 24 hours a day. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, please. And um, if you haven't turned there, turn to Luke 11. A man and his uh, wife were out shopping, grocery shopping one day, and they got to the they got to the vegetable section and the tomatoes had a pretty high price tag on them. Something had happened, some disease or something. And so they were debating, do we get these tomatoes or do we live without tomatoes for a while? And just as they were in the middle of that debate, a big earthquake hit, 6.4 earthquake, and stuff was flying off the shelves, glasses and cans going every which direction. And everybody was getting pretty shook up. They ducked for a minute and, you know, a few seconds and it was all over. Um, if you've been to California, you probably know what those are like. But it was done, and they finished their shopping. They went on and got home. And when they got home, they were unpacking the things. And the man looked around. He couldn't find any tomatoes. He said to his wife, where are the tomatoes? She said, well, weren't you there? God said, no. <laughs> we all want a message from God, right? Right? We want a personal message from God. We want a sign. We want a shortcut to spirituality. We want something spectacular. The spectacular takes a lot of different forms these days. I've heard of people who had dollar bills turned into 20s. I'm still waiting for that one. <laughs> and hadn't happened to mine yet. People talk about chickens being raised from the dead. I heard that one on television one night. Appliances healed. 
from their infirmities, empty gas tanks filled up supernaturally. I think the latest one that really seems to be making the rounds in a lot of places is gold fillings suddenly appearing in people's mouths. Jim, I'm sorry, you'd be out of business. <laughs> that one continues. Yes, I thought you did too. No claim is too bizarre is the point. And then there are those who claim to have been to heaven and back or to hell and back. We have these fantastical claims because we long for these, you know, these signs. We want this spectacular that will inform us and that will build our faith and that will somehow, somehow take us over. You know, in the midst of this, one of the things that's always been amazing to me is that people completely overlook, I know I got you in Luke 11, hold it, but, but uh, turn with me quickly. Well, I'll just read it. 2 Thessalonians. Let me read it for you. 2 Thessalonians 2, I'm in. If you're not aware of this passage, you need to be aware of it because it's, it's one of several in the Bible that speaks like this, but speaking of the end time events, Paul has this to say in 2 Thessalonians 2.9. He says, the coming of the lawless one is the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. What that tells us, beloved, is that Satan can do miracles too. He can't keep up with God, not even close, but he can do miracles. And those who are constantly seeking signs and wonders, and this is kind of the center of their existence, are opening themselves up to way more than they realize. No one did more amazing miracles than Jesus. Never in the history of the world has there been anything like what Jesus did. And yet they were not effective faith producers. You may remember in this, Pharisees accused him of doing the signs and wonders that he did by the, by the power of Satan. And Jesus answered that if you were here a few weeks ago. But then in verse 16 of Luke 11, we have this, we have this other group. It says, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign. They kept seeking from him a sign. So Jesus begins to answer that request in verse 29. And I think it's fair to say he was not amused. We began to look at it last week. He is not a freak show. He is not a miracle on demand genie. So he responds, in verse 29, by saying, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus considered this whole generation wicked because of their concentration on the sign instead of their concentration on the sign producer. They were stopping one step short, you see. Does God ever do miracles? Yes, he does. But they are not the norm, nor are they expected to be. And when we get concentrated on the sign, we have fallen one step short. And so Jesus is teaching the trouble with seeking signs over seeking the sign giver in this passage. And we said there are four principles, four great principles that we want to look at. The first two we looked at last time, the first one being one sign is never enough. Those people in verse 16 were seeking another sign after they had just seen. They had just seen a blind man and a mute man, couldn't speak, couldn't see, healed right in front of them. But they're seeking more. And we looked at other passages in Scripture where that continues to be the case. Jesus feeds 5,000. They're back the next day wanting another sign. And over and over in the Bible, we see this. One sign is never enough. That's why God says faith doesn't come by signs. It comes by hearing. Second principle, this, you know, the ultimate sign has been given. The ultimate sign has been given. Jesus uses two people from the Old Testament, Jonah being the first one, to teach a certain principle. And from Jonah, we learn the ultimate sign has already been given. He says, you're not going to get any sign except the sign of Jonah, which was what? It was the death and the resurrection of Jesus. 
Going back to the time when Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, what is that? Jesus, in the Matthew parallel passage to this, tells us that that was the evidence, the foreshadowing of the resurrection that he would go through. To reject that ultimate sign is to reject the most that God can ever do. And we have the good fortune to be on this side of it looking back on it, right? And so we have the ultimate sign has already been given. So today, let's look at the third and fourth principles from this passage. The third one is this. God's word trumps signs. God's word trumps signs. Spiritual blindness, I don't think, has ever been better illustrated than it is in the contrast that Jesus draws here between the queen of the south, which is the queen of Sheba, if you remember the Old Testament event, and his own audience here. We should probably turn back to 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings 10, and you'll find this account where the queen of Sheba hears about the wisdom of Solomon. And so she comes to see this wisdom. She comes for a visit. Now, Sheba was a thousand years to the, a thousand miles to the south and west of Jerusalem. Modern day Yemen is, is most likely where it is. Some of these we're not absolutely sure, but evidence is pretty good that that's where she was coming from. So she's coming a thousand miles to the north and to the east to see this man Solomon about whom she has heard so much. His fame has spread. And we read in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 3, well, she brings all these hard questions. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 3 tells us this, and Solomon answered all of her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. Now, we know that Solomon's wisdom came from where, right? It came from God, Back in chapter 4 of 1 Kings, if you just turn back a couple pages, chapter 4, verse 29, tells us, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand of the seashore so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people in the east and the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. God gave great wisdom to Solomon, but it wasn't Solomon's opinion. It wasn't Solomon's opinion that the queen concentrates on when she comments on his wisdom. And this is very interesting because she doesn't say, wow, Solomon, what a smart guy you are. And I'm guessing it's because Solomon credited the Lord who had given him this special wisdom as he spoke to her and answered her questions. Because if you go back to 1 Kings 10, And look at verse 9. You'll see what the queen's response is. She says, bless be the Lord. She didn't say, blessed be Solomon. She said, blessed be the Lord, Jehovah, your God, who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. She compliments Solomon, but she blesses God. And beloved, we know that this woman got it. She became on this small visit, she became a believer. We know that because Jesus credits her with that in his own testimony. So here's this queen who has come from this great distance and the contrast between her faith and that of the audience that Jesus is talking about is absolutely staggering. Jesus pictures, in order to get this across, he says, picture yourself standing in the judgment. Here's you on one side and here's the queen of the south on the other side. She's a pagan idolater to start with. You are the chosen people of God. She had only hearsay to direct her to come and try and find Solomon. You have literally centuries of the oral and written revelation of God. She had no invitation. You have the invitation of Jesus Christ. She came from the ends of the earth. You have it delivered at your front doorstep. 
She heard the word from Solomon, who was a wise man, no question about that, but Jesus says, you've heard the word from someone far greater than Solomon. You've heard the word from the word. You've heard it direct, right? She accepted, you reject it. No wonder Jesus says in the day of the judgment, she's going to stand up with the men of this generation and condemn them. The point is the word, beloved, trumps signs. If you reject the word, all the signs in the world are not going to help you. The word trumps signs. Now, I want to give you two reasons. There's probably more, but let me give you two reasons, quick reasons for this. Number one, signs can deceive the word can't. Signs can deceive, the word can't. The desire for the spectacular has led so many people down the road to destruction. Is there anything wrong with wanting God to do a miracle in a particular life? Absolutely not. But when the answer comes back, no, or wait, or whatever the answer may be, if that destroys our faith, beloved, we, 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 then that says our faith was in the sign, not the sign giver. I have seen that happen over and over and again. People assume that if they see a miracle, it must be of God. But hear me, not all miracles are from God. Not all miracles are from God. Signs can deceive, the word never will. Jesus himself warns of this. Jesus himself warns of this. In Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus says this, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. I mean, this is, a, this is a dire warning coming from Jesus himself that says, if you're on the lookout for signs, if you're hung up on that, you are just, I mean, you're opening yourself to who knows what. He says, even the elect, even believers might be deceived by this. Don't go there. Now, he's not suggesting that those who are truly elect can get unelect. He makes clear in John 10 that those who are, that, that, that the Father gives him, that are in his hands, cannot be taken out of his hands. But listen, we can live a wasted, frustrated, terribly unhappy existence because we are rushing after signs and making them the center of our existence. It can happen. It, it will happen. It is happening. In 2 Thessalonians Two that I read earlier. Let me read a little more of the context there. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning in verse 8, where Paul is describing the coming of one he calls the lawless one that we call, the same as, as in other places, identified as the Antichrist. He says, when that happens, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. But then he says this, the coming of the lawless one is with the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders. I have to tell you, when I first learned Greek, this was the first passage I turned to, to find out, do, do, are those words, with all power and false signs and wonders, are those the same words as apply to the miracles of Christ in the Gospels? They are. They are exactly the same. The difference is, the miracles of Christ were true. The miracles that these people perform are false. The miracles of Christ are from God. The miracles that these perform are from Satan. And if you, and if you notice in verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians 2, he tells us what the end result is of getting hung up on these signs. He says they refuse, people that do this, they refuse to believe the truth. And so to be saved. You make signs the center of your existence? You make that the thing that you're going to hang your, your faith on? And the, and, the, and, and the Bible is teaching you may not even come to faith in Christ. You will 
orient away from the truth. These people love miracles instead of the truth. They, listen, here's what they did, and here's what you want to look out for. They put their experience above the word. They interpreted the word in light of their experience instead of interpreting their experience in light of the word. So dangerous. Our emotions are all over the place. Dare not trust those. And that's what signs appeal to. He's saying, don't go there. And if you go down to verse 12 in 2 Thessalonians 2, you'll find out that even God got involved. Those who were doing this, he gave them a great delusion, it says. He sent them delusion. God sent them delusion. If you want to see how this plays out, look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. This is a passage that talks about the coming of this lawless one, this one that we call the Antichrist, who will basically at some point in time in the future have the whole world going after him. In the first 10 verses of Revelation 13, it talks about how this person experiences a mortal wound of some kind. He experiences a mortal wound from which he recovers, either by resurrection or false resurrection. But it's taken by the world as a great sign, as a wonder. And this guy, like most great leaders, he has a, he has a PR guy over here, right? He's taking, he's taking his lead from the PR guy, and the spin doctor is there at his side. He's a sidekick. And it says in Revelation 13, beginning in verse 12, the second beast, the one who is pointing toward the first, the press secretary, if you will, it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And now look at this, verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Would you think that's a great sign? If you saw that happen, would you tend to say, that must be God? We all would, but he's warning us. Verse 14, and by signs, by the signs that it is allowed to work, notice, allowed to work. Satan can't lift a finger without God allowing it. But he's allowed to work in the presence of the beast that deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Do you get the picture, beloved? Not all signs are God's signs. Not all miracles are God's miracles. Now you say, well, it's, okay, great, but this is, all, this, this is all end time stuff. This is when the wheels are all coming off and it's chaos on earth. This isn't happening now, really, have you, have you been around? Have you looked? Have you stood around after some of the miracle services to see who picks up the crutches and who gets back in the wheelchairs and so on? Because I have. And I'm not saying there are no signs, beloved. I'm just saying be extremely careful. All miracles are not God's miracles. Let me give you an example. Bishop Pike, some of you remember the early days of television, Bishop Pike was on all the time. He had a son who took his life. And he was like most people would be in that instance. He was anxious for communication. And so he wrote about it in a book, a communication that happened with his son. And he, he used the spirit medium, which, which is amazing, but he went to a spirit medium to try and contact his dead son, and he felt like he did, and here's what his son told him. He said, I failed the test, Dad. I, I can't face you, can't face life, I'm confused. Yet nobody here blames me. And then he went on to say, Jesus is a great example, but he's no savior. Don't need a savior. I mean, I don't even know where to start about the things that are unbiblical about that, those comments, right? I'm confused here. There's not going to be any confusion there. 
Nobody's blaming me here. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. That speaks to blame. And unless you have the righteousness of Christ covering you, you will find blame aplenty. But most of all, to say that Jesus is not a savior is to throw out the Bible from beginning to end. So what happened? What happened with Bishop Pike? Well, I think one of two things. I think he either found a medium who impersonated his son, which is very possible. This happens all the time. Or more likely, he found an unfamiliar spirit. What's an unfamiliar spirit? That's a demon who impersonates dead people. You go far enough into the realm of the spirit world and you can find whatever you want. The Bible says so. In Leviticus, God speaks to this very issue in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 6. It's not the only place, it's just an example. Leviticus 20 verse 6, God says, if a person turns to medium, mediums and necromancers, necromancer is a familiar spirit, literally. That's the way it would be translated, a familiar spirit. Whoring after them, insisting on, I have to have this. God says, I will set my face against that person. Not all miracles are God's miracles. So if you're going to seances or whatever, look out. You're doing exactly what the Lord says not to do. Beloved, false miracles abound even now in our day and age. You don't have to look very far. Holy laughter coming out of what was called the Toronto Blessing. Whatever else may have been good up there, one of the big things in the early 90s, it's, it's a movement that's fallen apart now, but the holy laughter was, a, was, the, was the big identifier in that. There's nothing biblical about it. There's nothing scriptural about it. It's purposeless. You can turn on the TV almost any night and see people being slain in the spirit. There's absolutely nothing biblical about that. It's not found in the Bible. It's purposeless, barking like dogs. I mean, the, the evidence is gone. Be careful. Are there miracles? Yes. Can we pray for them? Yes. Is it God's primary way of working today? No. It's not the norm. If it was the norm, every Christian person would have a huge edge. Well, the whole world would be Christian, wouldn't they? The whole world would be Christian. Why wouldn't you? God says, blessed are those who don't see and believe, right? False miracles abound, even today. But the problem is always the same, one is never enough. And this is exactly why the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, not the miracles of Christ, the word of Christ. That's where faith comes from. I'll tell you, Science can deceive the word, never will. The more you get into the word, that's where spectacular lives, beloved. The word is way more spectacular than anything you're gonna find. Second reason signs are subordinate to the word. Signs are subordinate to the word. God's word Trump's signs because signs are subordinate to the word. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. In this great ending sermon at the end of Moses' life. It reminds them of many things that have gone before. Urges them to godly living. He says this. Deuteronomy 13, beginning in verse 1. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, consider that he's from God. Is that what he says? Not what he says, is it? If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, in other words, it's a real miracle, 
And if he then says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams. Now watch this. For the Lord your God is testing you. Can you imagine that God uses false miracles to test us? But that's exactly what he's saying here. Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul or whether you love the miracle. That's what he means. What do you love? The word rules over miracles. God's saying even if somebody comes along and does a real miracle, if, it, if anything he says doesn't square with the word, you've got to run. You have to get away from there. It's a false miracle. Moses, I, I, frankly, Moses might have written this for the 21st century and just plugged in the word prosperity, gospel preachers, and dreamer of dreams. Producing some kind of miracle, but urging the worship of riches. Don't buy it. It's not of God. Look at Luke 16. Get back to Luke. Just turn ahead a couple chapters. Remember the story. Lazarus is a beggar who is sitting outside the gate of this rich man. That's the way he makes his living. That's the way he makes his food. And so as he's sitting out there at the gate of this rich man hoping for crumbs off his table, this goes on forever and ever until they one day they die. Life ends, but existence doesn't end. Lazarus joined Abraham in heaven. The rich man lifted up his eyes in torment in hell. And the first thing he does is to beg for relief. He's in torment. He says, can you send somebody just, you know, just a little bit of water? Somebody? But when he found out that was impossible, that there was this impassable gulf between him and heaven, he says in verse 27 of Luke 16, well, then I beg you, Father, speaking to Abraham, I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. In other words, they have the Bible. That's his way of saying the Old Testament, which at that time was as much of the Bible as was available. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. He's saying, no, 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 no. You don't understand. The word's not good enough. A miracle would do it. Somebody coming from the dead, then getting better than that, then they would repent. What did Abraham say? Verse 31, he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. If you won't believe the word, if you won't hang on to the word, if you won't embrace the word, all the miracles in the world aren't going to help. That's what he's saying. The word trumps miracles. The word trumps signs. This is God's word saying this, not mine. I would think somebody rose from the dead, that would do it. God says, nope, if they won't believe the word, that won't help. Frankly, it was proven a few, you know, a few weeks later when Jesus rose from the dead. Everybody in the world turned to Christ. So the word trumps signs. Fourth principle. The need is to see the Savior, not to seek a sign. The word, the, the need is to see the Savior, not to seek a sign. This is kind of beginning in verse 33. This is Jesus' final word to the sign seekers. It's a parable showing that in seeking signs, they were missing the sign. In seeking signs, they were missing the sign. That's the point. This, is, this has been kind of a difficult parable to interpret, but I think if you take it in context, you can see what he's trying to say here. In the beginning of verse 33, 
Luke 11, he says, now no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a, in the cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. It takes two things for us in order for us to be able to see, right? First of all, the thing seen has to be lit, right? It has to be light on it. I can, I can look at my hands and I can see them. I, you know, you can, you can see the hangnail on your fourth finger, right? You can see because it's lit. But when we talk about a night so black that you can't see your hand in front of your face, what's the problem? The problem is no light, right? And without light, you can't see. It can be right there just as close as it is now, but I can't even see it. I wouldn't know it was there. It has to be lit. That's the first thing that has to be there for us to see something. The second thing that has to be there is an eye that works, right? If your eye doesn't work, you're still not going to see it. It can be all lit up, but your eye is covered, or your eye is closed, or your eye is bandaged, or your eye is damaged in some way. And so you, so you may not be able to see it because of that. So both of those things have to be in place. The thing that you're trying to see has to be lit, and then your eyes have to be able to see. Now, in this parable, in this parable, the thing lit is the truth of God. It's God's revelation, which is most fully displayed and most clearly lit in the person of Jesus Christ, so much so that he's called the revelation of God. He's called the word of God. No one ever lit the world like Jesus, right? We have all these passages of Scripture that speak to that. John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 9, 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. John 12, 46. I have come into the world as light. So that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus lit the world up. Never has the truth of God been more clear, more revealed, more able to be seen than it was in the person of God. He is God's ultimate revelation. The generation that saw Jesus had it even better than we do because they had the word written and they had the word in the flesh <laughs> dwelling among them. You talk about light, it was light. God's truth is lit in the person of Christ. Remember how he says in Hebrews 1, I gave you my revelation in the old days through the prophets and the, and the, and the apostles, but now in these days, now in the last days through my son, Jesus, who is, by the way, the exact representation of God. Why? Because he is God. He's God in the flesh. What does he say in John 1.18? No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God, Jesus, he's revealed him. So the light is on. Do you get the picture? The light is on. There's no lack of light. And yet Jesus is looking at people who are saying, give us more Light. We want another sign. And Jesus is saying in verse 34, the problem isn't with the light. He says, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. The problem isn't with the light. The light is there. The light has been there. The light is shining brightly. The whole life of Christ demonstrates it. All the miracles that he ever did in his life demonstrates it. And of course, the resurrection of Christ demonstrates it more than anything else. The problem isn't that the thing trying to be seen isn't lit. The problem is that you're not looking. The problem is with your eye. He says, if your eye is healthy, and the word means simple or single, it's the opposite of, some of you have had this problem at times, I won't ask why, but double vision, right? Can't. See, there's two things out there. And when I reach for it, I just get thin air. It's double vision. He's saying, if your eye is healthy, it's not going to be like that. You have single vision. You'll be able to see. But your problem is the eye. It's your eye. It's not the light that's missing. It's your eye. 
you are willfully, you are willfully ignoring the, the light that's available. And you are turning away from Christ and the truth of God that's illuminated right there in front of you. John says this of these people. In John 12, verse 37, he says, though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Why? Because they couldn't? No. Because they wouldn't. It's not a matter that the light hasn't shined. And actually, Jesus tells us why in John 3, 19 where he says, this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people, this is a staggering statement, people loved the darkness rather than the light. Why did they do that? Because their deeds were evil. They didn't want their evil deeds made manifest. They didn't want to be accountable. The problem is denying that there's accountability doesn't do away with it if it's real, right? You can be driving down the road and get pulled over for doing 70 and a 35 and say, well, I don't really believe there's a law. But guess what? There is. And you're about to find out that denying accountability doesn't do away with accountability. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Seeking for another sign on the part of these people was just another excuse to go on living according to their own selfish desires trying to blame God instead of submitting to his lordship. Listen, beloved, nobody will ever be able to stand before God and say, it's your fault, I just needed one more sign. You're not going to be able to do that. All the signs that we could ever hope for are there in the person of Christ and in the word of God, and he capped it off at the greatest sign of all, the resurrection of Christ. Sign seekers are like the, you know, the old guy starting to feel like I'm getting to that age. You know, he, he goes to the museum and he's offering his opinions on all the artwork that's there at the museum. And he goes around from place to place, forgot his glasses, but that doesn't stop him. He's still going to tell everybody what's good and bad about every piece of art. And he kind of stops in front of a full-length portrait that's, that's standing there and, really being stared apart. He talks about how that frame just doesn't fit with the rest of the picture. I can't believe they so badly framed it. And you know, the subject is, man, what an, what an ugly subject that person is. Look at the shabby dress that he has. And I can't believe the artist used that guy for a subject. And his wife finally pulls him aside and said, honey, you're looking at a mirror. <laughs> looking at a mirror. See, the search for signs, beloved, says a lot more about the seeker than it does about the Lord. There's a willful blindness going on. There's a willful blindness going on that must be clarified and can only be clarified by an absolute trust in the Jesus who's revealed in the Bible. The search for the spectacular just leads down a lot of rat holes. God gives you a miracle in your life that's wonderful. Occasionally he does. But beloved, let the miracle be that you trust that Lord no matter what. I love the three guys who were asked to bow down to the fiery, bow down to the idol and they wouldn't do it. And Nebuchadnezzar was going to throw him in the fiery furnace in Daniel 3. Remember that? And what they say? King, you do your worst. You do whatever you want. We know our God can save us if he chooses to. But whether he does or not, that's who we're trusting. Father, we thank you for this word. It's a challenge to us. Challenge to us because so many times we desperately want the shortcut. We desperately want the life saved. We desperately want this. We desperately want that. And in our desperation, we're really not asking, what do you want? We're really not in submission to your will. We're insisting that your will become our will instead of the other way around. Such a dangerous position to be in. So Lord, I just, I just ask that you would bring this lesson home to us that we need to be focused on the sign giver and not on the sign. Trusting in the blesser, not in the blessing. And letting you work out in our lives that which is 
right and good and whole and that which will be best ultimately for us and for your glory. Help it to be true for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.